So what you'll see in the law test a lot of times is the difference, the difference between actual research and, and non-research or actual experiments and non-experiments. An experiment requires, so I have, and this is the time of COVID and the COVID vaccines. It's a great time to learn about experience, experiments. So I have 100 people in this group, right? And to have a true experiment of those 100 people, I'm going to randomize them. I'm going to put half in A and half in B, right? Random, not any particular way, just random. And then I'm going to give one group the COVID vaccine and the other group gets a placebo, right? I'm going to let them go live their life for six months and see what happens. They're going to come back. And then I'm going to determine whether or not the people that got the placebo are different than the ones who got the real drug. Okay. Placebo or nocebo means they got, they didn't get the real drug, the sugar pill, or they didn't get anything. And the uh, other people got the, they got the drug. Control group is the one that does gets nothing. I'm, I'm controlling them. They got nothing. The other group, the experimental group got it. So to have a true experiment, it has to be randomized. Again, keywords, randomize, and a, a, a experimental group and a control group. And then I'm going to compare them at the end. A quasi-experiment, and you'll see that a lot, a quasi-experiment is the one that you can use with your agency. A quasi-experiment is not randomized. That is the only one that's okay to use in an agency. You can see that's like the double eyes there. The quasi-experiment is not randomized. The, the research is similar to experimental research, except the randomization of subjects in treatment and the control group is not possible. Because if I come to your agency and you guys talked about what it was like, I'm trying to get my Xanax, right? <laughs> I'm coming to your agency and I think you're treating me. You cannot put me in a control group where I'm getting no, getting the placebo instead of the real medicine. That's it. You get illegal, right? Unethical. That's unethical, not illegal. Unethical. I think I'm coming and you're not giving me the medicine, that's not okay. So in your agencies, if you're looking at the, the uh, looking at research to use with a new drug, a new design in an agency, that's a test question, in the agency, it's always going to be quasi-experimental because I cannot give people, uh, I cannot put them in a research program without their permission. Now, if a client comes in and says, hey, wait a minute, I know there's a research program going on and I want to join it and I don't mind if I get the, the other drug, that's okay. Right, because they're aware of it and they ask. And we ask them. So that's quasi. So true experiments are research, right? They have two control groups, they are randomized. So when it comes to again, back to research, I'm looking at quantitative, you see my screen. A survey is not experimental. Okay. I give out a survey, you come home. I didn't do experiment, right? All I want to do is, is see how you feel. Most often what we get back, what we're hoping back is 40%. We're going to send out 100, test question, send out 100, and hope we get at least 40% back. Okay. Descriptive data really just des literally describes it. It talks about, if you're looking in the question, the words of describing the data. Correlation, correlation is my R value. That's my correlation coefficient. Okay. So I'll hang on to that. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Talk about, oh, well, I'm going to go into that now. Okay. So correlation coefficient. What that means is there is a correlation, a relationship between the two items. Oh, I hear some beep in there. Okay. So I'm going to pull this up, my worksheet here. I'm a great artist, in case you don't know. Okay, my correlation coefficient is a qualitative research. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, so with correlation research, what you might see sometimes is your R value. R just means correlation, that's all that means. Okay, it's your Pearson's R, but what I'm looking for is the correlation, which is the relationship between two items. That is part of quantitative, I'm sorry, qualitative research. Okay. Miss Pam? Yeah. It's 
why is it qualitative if it's listed under quantitative? That, that's what's one of the things that's confusing me with this. Okay. So correlation is always relationships. So it's not qualitative, it's quantitative. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, wait, I'm sorry, let's go back. It's qualitative, not quantity. Correlation is not quantity. Now ask me that question again. Did I say it wrong? Okay, so if you look, you're looking at where it says types of research quantitative, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And number IV, right, says correlational. So in my mind, you group, you group that as quantitative. Is that wrong? Okay, I'm under IV. What number? Five? Uh, yeah, I'm under, I'm just, I'm, I have a paper copy of this. And it okay. just says the types of research quantitative and correlation falls under quantitative. You see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so tell me where I'm at. So where, where, I'm, looking, where I'm missing. Sorry, I don't know that one. Okay, so I started there, qualitative and quantitative. Okay, research may be inductive, deductive, quantitative. Okay, I see where you're at, correlation. Okay, so correlation uses the correlation coefficient to determine the degree of the relationship between the, the two people. So what we're looking at, if we're using correlation, we can, no, I'm going to go there. For the test, for the test, what you want to know is correlation is going to be call, not cause and effect, it's relationship. Okay. It can be correlation, but for the test, they're not going to ask you that. They're not going to ask you that. What you need to know is correlation is always going to be a relationship. Okay. It's a relationship. I can tell what my answer is going to be on something else, have determined, determined on this correlation. Okay. So I'm just going to say, just ignore that because that's going to confuse you. The test doesn't get that deep. It really doesn't. It really just is on the knowing that it's a, it's a qualitative. Okay. So let me go back. Thank you for bringing that up, Candy. Thank you very much. My that wasn't board. me. That was somebody else. Oh, wow. Whoever said that, thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You could have just taken credit. All right. So correlation is my R. That is my Pearson's R. Okay. So correlation, perfect correlation is 1.0. And I think we covered that more in assessments last week. Okay, so we can talk about that just a little bit, but correlation, perfect correlation, means that two items match. That if I do well on one test, the assumption is I'll do well on other. That's a correlation, and that goes under quanti quality, oh goodness, qualitative, quality, quality, quality. That's where that goes. Okay. So, let me pick up, go back. Inductive and deductive reasoning. Let's look at those. So inductive reasoning is we're always thinking about Sherlock Holmes. When we induce, the assumption is, is like, you know, Columbo, where we found the clue first. Inductive reasoning suggests that I have found the clue and that I'm going to go back and prove my theory. Okay. So uh, Sherlock Holmes, Columbo, law and order. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the dead body first. Remember the game Clue? You find the dead body in the, off, in the office or the library. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to do some research. I'm going to then hypothesize and then my theory. The butler did it in the kitchen. The husband did it. All those things based on this observation. But I'm proving my theory. I'm going this way. Okay. Inductive reason is innocent until proven guilty. I have an observation, but I can't prove it yet, so I'm going to base on this information and then prove it. Deduction is the other way. Deduction is there's a dead body in the, the, in the family room, and I'm sure the wife, the husband did it. Wife's body is dead. I'm sure the husband did it. Okay, and what I'm going to do is find my research to prove it. Okay, 
So deductive is with theory first. I'm sure he did it, and I'm just trying to find the evidence to prove him guilty. Other way, inductive, I have the observation first, but I'm not going to prove anybody guilty until I finish my research. Okay? So I deduce or I induce. Deduce is you are guilty. I'm going to arrest you first. You're guilty, right? And then I'm going to find the information to prove you guilty. I'm going to confirm my theory. Induction is the other way. Okay, so I was at quanti quantitative, right? Talked about the quantity. Okay, so again, um, non my non experiment designs, my surveys, descriptions, comparative, all those things belong under my quantitative. That term ex post facto that means after the fact. It's also called um, causal comparative. Okay, the research design studies possible causal relationships among variables after the fact. Okay, so I've done this research and then some new information has come up, and now I have to tie this research in to either cause or compare with new research because I didn't realize it when I was in the middle of my research. In the real world, if you're doing research and ex post facto uh, information comes up, you have to actually go back and, and amend your research. For example, two, two employee agencies conduct job uh, conduct job clubs. In one agency, the job clubs are members are member initiated and run, whereas the other one, the employee counselors provide instruction and guidance. In examining the job placement rate for members in the past year, you find that members of the professionally led group were at a higher rate. Okay, so I found this out after I did my research. That's when I'd have to go back and add that. We're talking about true experiments. Talk about a quasi. Okay. Qualitative. Qualitative research emphasizes gathering data about naturally occurring phenomena, right? You're, you're the individual's group and living experience and events. Phenomena, your phenomenological view, right? So data of collection may be in instead of using numbers, I'm going to look at data collection. So again, the quality is where your needs met, right? When you went to the doctor's office, did he meet your needs? When you went to Walmart today and they said, if you for $100, if there's a chance of winning $100, please fill out this survey, right? They're looking at, did you meet the, did you, or your expectations met? Okay. The third types, a case study, stop. A case study. That is what Anna O was. Freud did a case study. It can be a past event. It can be a current event. Okay. It can be a group of people. It can be a person or an incident. So, for example, in my area, there was a school bus crash uh, in November of, well, it's been like three years ago, four years ago, three years ago. Um, and the it was right after the day before Thanksgiving, before school let out. It was an inner city school. It was a very close knit school. And the bus driver, um, um, there were several several fatalities. The kids were killed. Um, it was it was it was horrific. It was a tragedy in our area. There have been there's been tons of case studies on that done on the the, the the viewpoint of the driver, the viewpoint of the school system, the viewpoint of the kids. Right. So this one particular case. Had lots of studies about it, but we're looking at this one event, okay? But it can be a past event. So again, Freud did his study on Anna O. He came up with his theories based on a past event studying her case. That term ethnography means I'm looking at the case from the client's viewpoint, their ethnical, their ethnic, their, from their ethnicity, from their viewpoint. So the goal of an ethnography is to actually be part or, become, or join or be part of the group I'm looking at to see the research from their viewpoint. It's descriptive and interpretation of culture or social groups or systems. Data is typically collected through observation and interviewing. Um, when, uh, you're not old enough to remember, but Jane Goodall, when she lived with the monkeys for a while and she had like, watched and observed, that was an ethnograph. She was looking at living with the lives of monkeys, or the gorillas. 
right? She tried not to do too much. She tried just to observe. There were cameras everywhere, but that's how, how she saw it from, from not necessarily a culture, but being in that. That was definitely a phenomenological being part of that. Um, right now with our COVID, right? We know that COVID has affected many different cultures, very different ways. So if I want to do a, view, a, a study of, of, you know, a, of a Native Americans, right? And Native Americans and how COVID faced them differently, then I would, you know, really become enjoyed and interview and observe Native yeah. Americans to kind of look at it from their viewpoint. A mixed method, that just means you can do both qualitative and quantitative, which is done quite often. Okay. Simple subject design, you must know, often know what that is. Um, that's an ABAB, right? Okay. Baseline, intervention, baseline. So you do this every day in your office, most of you. And uh, it can be a single person or it can be a single classroom. So my ABAB design, again, I'm going to take a baseline first. A client comes in and he says he's depressed. Oh, my gosh, I'm so depressed, Dr. Pam. I don't know what to do. In my assessment, I'm going to ask him, is it five times a week? Is it every day? Like, what does it look like for you? I'm taking a baseline, right? That is my first thing, baseline. Then I'm going to give my intervention. Well, I think you should, you know, what we know is CBT, right? CBT and medication works best with my affective disorders. So he's depressed. So then I'm going to set, tell him, I'm going to get him in with the doctor, and we're going to start some CBT, right? I do my intervention, and I'm seeing, wow, he's gotten so much better. Look at that. Wow. Then I'm going to have him come back in a few weeks and test him again. And I'm hoping that his depression has, his, his, has gotten better, right? He's feeling less depressed. That is ABAB. That is my subject, my, my baseline, intervention baseline. We can also do it with a group. So if you see on this one, it's got the classroom. So they're measuring the percent of time studying. Okay, look at that. 20, 40, 60, 80, 90, 100%. That's how much they're studying. I've come in, I've taken a baseline. I see that many of these students are like at like 20%, 40%. And I really want them to study more. So then I'm going to do an intervention of positive attention, right? Come back, take another baseline to see if it worked. And then come back again, measure again, and hope that the positive attention increased. Okay, single subject design. A, B, A, B, A, B. That's all that means. A single subject design is not what you would use in your agency. Okay? Because the question that talks about how you're going to evaluate your agency, it would not be that one. A pilot study, of course, is just a small study to make sure that we're going, that, that I can uh, try it on my bigger community later. Pilot studies are being done now with, um, I think, pregnant women in COVID. I think that's where we're at with pregnant women in COVID. We've got a small group of people. We're trying on that small group of people and hoping that we can make some generalized assumptions based on that. Longitudinal studies. Longitudinal studies are long term. That's how we know that smoking is bad for you. Back in the day, and I, I teach college and on my, my the same floor are my nursing instructors. And a lot of my nurse instructors used to tell me how back in the day, there was a smoking corner for nurses, right? The Marlboro man was cool. He came out on his horse. We didn't know smoking was dangerous. We know that because of longitudinal studies, right? So now we know that people who started smoking in their 20s, that it's dangerous. So we, that's based on long term. You might also see like the kids, we test them the first time in first grade and, and we're seeing them when they graduate, right? That's long-term, same group of people, long-term. Now a cross-sectional is one at is one time, it's like a snapshot, it's a moment in time, okay? So if I, my eraser there, okay? So let's say that um, I want to know what the typical family buys for the weekly dinner, okay? So it's, oh, it's the first of the month, too. So I know that, like, probably some government assistance came in. So I'm just trying to figure out. I'm going to do some research on what families buy. So I'm going to ask all of you to go outside and send outside your local Walmart tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. from 10 to 12. I want you to interview five families. And no matter where you're at, interview your five families. That's a cross-sectional. Same time, 10 a.m., Different data points, different times, I'm sorry, different places apart of the country, but you're going to collect the same data. So 
So I can tell you that on Sunday morning at, from 10 to 12 a.m. that people brought, uh, families bought this much or this is what they bought. So cross-sectional always includes you're collecting data from different people, but at the same time, okay? I can tell if people at the other, um, uh, in some parts of the country buy, buy more of this or some people in the part of countries buy more of that. Um, an anecdote, so I'm a girl, I was a Girl Scout when my kids were little and we also always sold Girl Scout cookies. Um, and what we found is that one of our local grocery stores, and I'm in the South, I'm in Chattanooga, so we don't, we, the beer and wine laws are very different on what you can buy at the grocery store and what you can buy at the, the liquor store. So just be, bear with me. But we did find that on Saturday nights, there seemed to be a correlation on the more beer people bought at the grocery store and the more Girl Scout cookies they would buy from us. Because we would come out and we could kind of watch their carts and what was in their cart. And if we, we would notice that the high-end beer people even spent more money on cookies, too. So, and again, that's not really and research, but anecdotal. But we kind of, because we sold at different grocery stores and we would do Friday nights. So that's what it kind of looked like. So that's a, a cross-sectional. It's more than one group of people, but all at the same time. That term meta-analysis, all that means is a research, is a, a, is a lit review, a part of research. Lots of studies. I'm going to go back and I'm going to read them. Okay. Internal validity. Validity, we know it has to be valid. Validity matters that, that it says what it's, it does what it says it's going to do. Internal validity is the inside, whether it's the inside of the research or the inside of the test. So internal validity, okay. Um, gosh, I was tutoring someone today. Hmm. Sometime this week I was tutoring someone and the word was ambivalent. And not knowing what the word ambivalent meant affected the tests, right? Those are, that's, those are the test questions. If you don't understand the test questions, right, it's going to change your score. So bias lies inside internal validity. That is where the, the bias lies. We do know there is not one assessment, not one piece that doesn't have bias. When we look at the NCE or any of those other mental health exams, they are written for the majority. Okay. The majority of mental health providers in America today are going to be upper middle class Caucasian people. So if you don't fit that, do know that that test is written for that population. That's internal validity. So if there are words you're not familiar with or things that you're not sure of, it is going to be um, making sure that you understand um, the, the way the questions are written. Um, I was tutoring someone earlier and the, the question talked about a... Um, a counselor was interviewing a uh, someone of a different culture. Now, the, que the, the, the question did not say, the it did not give the racial makeup of the counselor. But the assumption is, guys, we're taking the test that the counselor is, is middle class white American. Okay? So if you don't look that way, remember, that's where test bias lies. It is based on that population. And it's not good or bad. We just live in a country where the majority of people are the majority of people in the country, as well as the majority of people in this field, are middle class white Americans. OK, so when you're taking the test, be sure that you understand that. So internal validity is the validity of the test the inside. So how much I can control the inside of the test, my selection of subjects who I choose to take the test. Instrumentation is just a fancy word for the test. Right. That's just a fancy word for the test. Maturation. I tell you the way that one of the reasons that pocket prep is not good if you keep doing it is because you, you have reached maturation. Maturation or other change in the subject um, are and not due to the treatment being applied. Okay, this is looking at research, but the same thing works with pocket prep. Okay. So then if you are doing pocket prep and the first time you're getting 30s, 40s, 50s, and oh my god, I'm up to 80 and 90, I'm doing so much better. You've just outgrown, you've matured, you know the subject areas, you know what the test is going to ask you, right? But that is not general, we can't generalize that to other tests. It just means you do well on that test. Morality or, attri or attrition. Attrition is people just kind of fall off. So imagine you're doing, you know, research and you're doing some longitudinal research. 
So, you know, the people that you start off in kindergarten are probably not going to be there. They're going to just drop off at some point. Um, Aturation is what happened in, in uh, grad school or undergrad school. And the professor said, look to your left and look to your right. Half these people won't be here, right? People just normally fall off. Experiment or bias. Okay, and again, that's not because I don't like the color of your skin or the way you look. But when I'm doing an experiment, I many times am looking for the answers that I want to see. Right? So sometimes some experiment or bias does play in there. The halo effect, right? That also comes in that place. The halo effect is that when I see like um, someone who's amazing and they're smart and they're charming, all that good stuff, I'm more likely to believe them. Sometimes that plays into experiment or bias. Okay. That term statistical regression, you'll see that not only in this area, you also see it um, in um, the assessments piece as well as uh, in the assessments piece. All that means. Um, do you not see here? Can we just log in? Is there somewhere else we need to log into the, for the tutoring session? So if you're in with me and you do not see my screen, I'm not sure what the question is asking me. Do you see my screen? Yes? No? A lot of hands? Show of hands? Okay. So... Remember my infamous 68, 95, 99 rule we talked about in assessments, okay? 68, these are, these are rules. Math have rules. Always have rules, okay? So what we know, if there are 100 people in the world, that 68% of them are going to be this part. That is two-thirds of the part of the people in the, in the survey, okay? I know two-thirds, like 67 point something, 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 but the, bill, the thought is that two-thirds of the people are going to be here. That is my first standard deviation. That's my 68. That's the pink part. We all love the pink. The blue part, of course, I'm going to add, and then I'm going to add to get my 68, 95, 99. Let me actually show you what it looks like because sometimes you'll see those uh, broken down different ways. Okay, so that's what it looks like if you're, you know, so sometimes it'll say the 34 and the 34. That's where your 68 comes from, right? That's your first standard deviation. The 68. That's the pink. That's your 68. And again, if I add the 13, 13, 13, that's my second standard deviation. That's where my 95 is going to come in. That's the second one. And the third one, of course, is your 2.14. So again, this is 99.7% of people in the world will fit in our normal bell curve. That, that statistic we just talked about was statistical regression. So what I know, if a student scores really high, okay, really high, which is way over here, like the 0.13%, or over here in the really low, which is the negative 4, or really high, which is the positive 4, if they take the test again, they're going to score closer to the middle. That's called statistical regression. Just a fact. Don't ask me why. We don't care why. We just know that's what's going to happen. They're going to score closer to the middle. Math has facts. Okay, so one of the reasons that it's hard for us in, in our, our soft sciences, right, is uh, we don't do well with facts, right? Because, you know, if one plus one doesn't want to equal two, they've got client self-determination, and we respect that. They made some changes, and we're going to say, yay, they're almost two, right? Math doesn't work that way for us. For, so it, it really kind of, uh, it, we think differently than many of the people who are very black and white. But that term is called statistical regression. Okay. So validity internal, those are the inside of the research, inside of the test questions. Validity is, does it do what it's supposed to do? Does it measure what it's supposed to measure? Is it valid? Okay. If I go in and I take that dollar store pregnancy test, it better be valid, right? That's all that matters is validity. Internal validity is that either your research or the inside of your instrument. Now, external validity, and you'll see some of the same terms, external validity just means, now can I take this whole test and apply it across the country, right? So can I take this whole test right here, the NCE, and if someone studied exactly the way that I studied, and they should get the same score despite they're on the other side of the country, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what that means of external validity. It's the outside of the text. So I can generalize this research to everybody else. 
So again, celestial subjects, that term ecological validity, you'll see that often. All that means is if I am doing a test and I've only done it in the lab, let's say that I am watching children uh, play with toys and I've only done it in the lab. And now I want to go ahead and observe them in the real, real classroom. So I may get some bias there. It may not be um, valid because what I saw in the lab might be different in the classroom. Your ecological system is your real world, right? That's things that are around you. That Hawthorne effect, you might see that. Hawthorne effect means that we work differently when people are watching. When we first had COVID and everybody had to go home and work from home and your boss calls you every 15 minutes to see what you were doing. Or if you're a Medicaid provider, you had to document every 15 minutes what you were doing because they were afraid that you weren't working. Of course we weren't working. We were home. It was COVID, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, I'm speaking for myself. However, so that is, that is the Hawthorne effect. The assumption is if we can't see you, then you're probably not working as hard. Now, the main characteristics, I have seen that in the study guide, but I have not actually had anybody tell me that was on the test. Demand characteristics are cues, information, um, knowledge, uh, even rumors that the subject has heard about the experience. Okay, so demand characteristics are I have some kind of clue or something before I even got into in there. Okay, so someone said that you get um, Hawthorne uh, as opposed uh, confused with Halo. So Hawthorne is if somebody is looking, okay? You might see a question. That little Barbara, she's in the classroom, and she heard that someone is going to observe her this week. A little Barbara gets straight A's all week. Oh, my gosh, because she knows someone is watching her. The halo effect is um, something about that person, whether it's the researcher or that person, that I'm more likely to believe them. The halo effect, um, okay, one second, um, I'll get, I'll cover that, okay? The halo effect is um, when you leave a restaurant and the food is really good and you've had the best time and ask you to fill out the survey, right? Sometimes before you get the check, because they want to know how did it make you feel? You're feeling really good, just like my belly's full and it was a great time. Uh, a great example, if you're old enough to remember, um, there was a show on Sunday nights and it was about this little angel. And all these wonderful things would happen. It was called Touched by an Angel. And at the end of the show, she would light up and have a halo over her head. Like, oh my gosh, how amazing. You were so wonderful. All these things happened. That's the halo effect. Now, the Rosenthal effect is known also as the Pygmalion effect. Okay, so don't get those. And if, you, if you've heard his CD, so say it's not me, it's not that Rosenthal. The Rosenthal effect is the same as the Pygmalion effect. That is called the self, um, what was it called? Um, wow, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find what I'm looking for. That's what that's called. Um, Self-serving bias. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find what I'm looking for. Um, so what we're looking for, that what that means is in research, we have to be really careful that, that we're using some double bind, some research, some very clear um, additional observers, some factual information, so we don't get caught into hoping what we see. Uh, my PhD research was on a program that I wrote. So I wrote a certificate um, for the state of Georgia that um, helps people who are former drug users come back or people who already have a degree um, to get a certificate in substance abuse uh, treatment. OK, I wrote the program. I wrote it. I wrote it with my own hands and fingers and toes and, and took lots of hours, and lots of research. And I love this baby. Oh, my gosh, it's my baby. I burst it and I did research on it. And I went before the IRB, that was the biggest issue, is making sure that I could be objective on my baby, right? You mothers and fathers out there, you know your baby is the prettiest thing ever, right? Because we, we're not objective on my baby. So that's what that talks about. So in order to avoid me hoping to find what I was looking for, there had to be some other pieces put into place. So to avoid the Rosenthal or the Pygmalion effect, okay? That term placebo, that means I've given you something instead of the medicine. Um, and the, uh, the um, you might also see nocebo, that means you got nothing. And there's a placebo. I'm sorry, there's Rosenthal and Pygmalion. 
refers to the self-fulfilling expectation of doing well because it's expected or still looking for. So Rosenthal and Pygmalion are used simultaneously. Okay. You should know these guys, your levels of measurement. Okay. I'll pull those up for you. So looking at nominal, ordinal, So with nominal and ordinal, I'm going to use them with um, qualitative data, quality, quality, quality. So norm, nominal and ordinal belong to the quality, okay? Nominal are just categories. So if I'm doing research and I'm looking for, uh, I've, I've looked at men and women, I put them in a separate category. Or if I'm looking at order, so first, second, third, fourth is ordinal data. That is the order that things go in. Intervals, intervals are looking at between, it's the same amount of time. So interval is time, right? So the minutes on the clock, um, the, um, if you get paid every two weeks, that's an interval, right? That's, a, that's an interval. Ratio is in my numbers. Four out of five doctors prefer, two out of three doctors prefer. Ratio can have a true zero, okay? No doctors prefer crest. An interval supposedly doesn't have a zero. OK, your time, your clock should never stop. If you use a thermometer, it should always be a certain amount of degrees. So there's no true zero in an interval. So ratio and interval are quantitative. Ordinal and nominal are qualitative, your quality. Okay. Your chat box. Oops. Okay. Some types of sampling you need to know. Random sampling means I stand out like anybody. Just random. Just random. Stratified means I'm looking for a certain group. So if it's stratified, I am looking for um, only men, only women, people who are six foot older and six foot tall and old and, and taller, people who are younger than three. Very specific stratified. Proportional stratified means I want my group to look like my real population. So for example, if I'm looking at some proportional sampling and I want to make sure it represents America, right? If I want to represent America, then I would make sure that I had at least, um, it's America is 60% um, white, right? White, non-Hispanic. So I'd have six people in there who were white. Um, the number of African-American people is like 13.4. So I'd probably get one person who was black. Um, our Hispanic population, where that's a culture, not a race. So I might have like one of those, one Asian, one other. So my 10 people would look like America. That is proportional. That means I'm looking at the exact number of people in the my bigger group to make sure I get a right number. Cluster sampling really is geographical. Okay, so I'm looking at people who live on the same street. All the fifth grade classrooms at the end of the, the program or, or at the end of the hallway. It is, they're geographically located. Purpor purposeful studying, again, when I did my research, I was only looking for people that graduated from my program. So it wasn't everyone in America had a chance. It really was just based on people um, that purposely would be in my study. It was randomized, but it was still very much purposeful. You'll see those on there. What we're looking for is that minimal sample size, okay? Correlation, looking for relationships, we like 30. Ex post facto, about 15. Surveys, about 100. We know with surveys, we're only going to get about 40% back. Okay, those are things that you need to know. You might see this one also. Also, when we do research, we only do 5 to 10% of the population. Does anybody in this room know someone who's been in COVID trials? Yes, no. One person. Anybody else? OK, so so let's figure, you know, if if if, if there are like, you know, four billion people on this earth, we're only going to do five to 10 percent of those people when it comes to any kind of COVID trial. 
So the goal is that those populations, those pilot studies are really, really small. So you only need five to 10% of the population. Does that make sense? So what it looks like in real life, okay? Because when we're doing those research, we didn't go out and vaccinate everybody. We didn't go out and try the research on everybody. Only five to five to ten percent of the people. Descriptive studies are sometimes called summary studies. That just means they're giving me detailed, um, um, detailed, uh, uh, detailed information. Inferential means I can infer, okay? We have inferred a lot with the COVID vaccine. So what we did is if say, let's say that we only use 10% of the people, right? So what we assume now is 10% of those people that did okay with the COVID, the rest of the population will, go, will do it as well, right? We've inferred. Now COVID has been much better than the past. In the past, most of our research was done really on white men. So like when Tylenol first rolled out or ibuprofen, we really kind of just did it on the majority population. Now we have better research. And when we do research on COVID or any other new drug, we really try to make sure we get purposeful, like people of color, people who are young, people who are old, pregnant people. We're getting purposeful so we can then infer. So if I, if I tested this COVID vaccine on, you know, pregnant women and I tested on children, I tested on people of color, I can infer that it works for everybody in the population, not just a certain um, a specific group in the population. Okay. Parametric and non-parametric. Those seem to be the different ones with my T-test and my ANOVA and all that good stuff, right? Okay. So. This term significance level, this is your type one and type two errors. Your type one errors are going to be based on what is true and what is not true. So my type one error or my alpha error, okay? So my, my type one error, I'm going to assume. Okay. Type one errors are errors, um, type one or alpha errors are the names we're referring to with rejection of the null. We're saying there's no difference. So a type one error is going to, you're going to reject the null. Okay, so that's my type one error. Okay, I'm saying there is no difference when I did my research. Okay, a type two error is when I accept the false. And I always remember type two is 2AF, that's best works best for me. Okay. So failure to reject the null hypothesis when there is a difference. There truly is a difference. And it was the, and I accepted that. It was a false. That's my my 2AF is my to accept the false. So probability is going to be your 0.95. So what that means, if I have a 0.95 probability, and that's usually where we started off at, that there is out of a hundred. There is a five out of a hundred chance that my research is wrong. That's what that means at the 0 0.95. I'm sorry, at the 0 0.05, which is 95. There's only a five percent, the five out of a hundred, a five percent chance that my research is wrong. That's my p-value, my probability error. So what I know though is if I change my probability error, if I change it from 0 0.05 and I change it to 0 0.01, I've taken it to a 99%. So what it's telling me now is that 99 out of 100, there's only 1% chance that my error is, is that there's going to be an error in my research. Okay, so at 5%, you're willing to accept the possibility of rejecting the null, that's your type one, five out of 100 times. Okay. So that's your 95, that's your 0.95, P is 95. I'm willing to accept the probability that my, that my, that I should have accepted it, that I'm going to reject the null, five out of 100. That's my type one error. However, if I increase that to 0.99, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to change my significance level. And if I change my significance level, then I'm, it makes it really, a, so my error level has gone down. So then what that means is as your significant level goes down, if I take it from 0.05, which was 95%, I take it to 0.01, which is 99%, then my type 1 errors decrease. Okay. 
So my significance level goes down. That's my p-value. As my p-value goes down, and understand I'm taking it from 95 to 99. Okay, so it's going down the amount of error. So at, at 95, it was a 0.05 chance of error. At 99, it's a 1% chance of error, one out of 100. So if I take my p-value from 95 to 99, my type 1 errors will decrease. However, my type 2 errors will increase. Okay? You don't need to know why. You really don't. Okay? Just go back and make sure that you have re that you rewatch this video and memorize it. And if you've had me before, I don't say that you memorize a lot. Just don't. You need to learn most things. But math are facts. The same way you learned your multiplication tables is the same way that you need to know the facts. So p-value of 0.95, that's 5 out of 100% chance that there's an error. That's where we normally set our error when doing research. However, what I want to do is I want to change it to 0.99. I'm then going to, um, it's referred to as increasing it, right? I'll see that, okay? So a t-test. So a t-test and a NOVA and a MANOVA. You'll see these often, okay? So if you watched any of my videos before, a t-test is one dependent variable and two independent variables. In this one, they give me client self-esteem, and my independent variable is going to be then whether they're male or female, my independent variable. So I always talk about my independent variable, and I think um, Roosevelt talks about your body, right? Your body, you're lying in a hospital with your DV, your dependent variable, you're just laying here. Oh, my gosh, I can't get better. I'm dependent on medication. My IV is the independent variable. Those are the medications you're going to put inside of me, right? So let's say I'm laying there and I've got this awful, awful, nasty flu. And the first day the doctor comes over and he gives me, he gives me a, um, a oral antibiotic, right? He puts it in my mouth and oh my gosh, he comes back and I'm not better. 24, 40 hours later, I'm still sick. And then they're going to give me a liquid or an IV antibiotic. That's a T-test. I use two independent variables, right? The dependent variable is my, my, my body. The dependent is my, my me getting better. So my dependent variable is going to get better. I'm going to measure that based on my IV, my independent variable. So if I have two IVs, that is a T-test. Two is for T, T-test. So now let's take it up a notch. So let's say now we've got those two things and it didn't work. So if I look at a one-way analysis or an ANOVA, and on the test, you're only going to see one way. They're not going to test you on two-way. They don't want you to be math the statisticians. They don't. They just want to do you know the basics, the very basics of research. Okay. So ANOVA just means three or more levels, three or more independent variables. So again, I'm still measuring my, my, this is measuring self-esteem, but you can measure my DV, my body, right? Okay. So we tried the, the first day we tried the liquid antibiotic, it didn't work. Oh, we tried the oral first. We tried the liquid antibiotic the next day, it didn't work. And it comes the third day and it gives me a shot. That's an ANOVA. That's three independent variables with one dependent variable. Okay. So one dependent, more than two levels of my independent, my IV. A factorial analysis. You will know a factorial analysis because there's so much stuff going on in that question. It's going to make you crazy. Okay. So a factorial analysis still only has one DV, right? One DV. Still trying to make me better. My body trying to make me better. However, what I'm going to look at is several different things about that. Okay, so one dependent, and this one it's my self-esteem, or it can be my body. Okay, but I have two or more independent variables, right? That's that's the ANOVA already. I've added you know more, but there are all these different factors that have to do with my IV. Okay, so again, I'm sick, I'm laying in the hospital, I've got this nasty infection, and, and we've tried, like, the first day we tried the, the pill, and the second day we tried the IV, and the third day that we tried, we got the, the, um, the shot, right? And now we're going to think, well, let's try some different things. Let's see if we give the oral antibiotic with food. 
Let's say if we give the the uh, the liquid IV, what happens if we give it in the afternoon? What happens if the hot male nurse gives it to her? Hmm, will she get better? Let's see. So what I'm looking for is lots of different factors, all these different things affecting my IV, the independent variable. But I still only have one DV. No matter what happens with all those IVs, all I'm going to match, all I'm going to measure is what happens to my DV. That's my body. Did my body get better, right? So I'm still only having one DV, a t-test. I have two independent variables, two things, okay? If you've seen my other videos of why I was talking about my coffee, right? Or my water. So let's say I have my water bottle in front of me. That's my DV. My water bottle is water. I'm so tired of drinking water. It doesn't taste good. Gosh, I need some change to my water, okay? So I go downstairs and I get a lemon today. Mm, I taste it. Tomorrow I come back, I get a lime. See if there's any difference in my water. My water's my DV, right? The outcome is in my DV. So, oh my goodness, that's a T-test, right? Two independent variables, lemon and lime on my DV, my water. I will measure the outcome of my DV. How did it change my water? T-test. So let's say again, I'm going to try, I'm still working on this water. I got to drink water. The doctor says I need like a thousand ounces a day, right? Okay. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Oh, lots of water. So the lemon, the lime. Okay. So tomorrow let's try an orange. Let's try some mint. Let's try all those things on different days. Any more than two is an ANOVA, right? I'm trying the lemon on Monday, the lime on Tuesday. On Wednesday, I'm going to throw in a pineapple. On Thursday, I'm going to put maybe an orange slice. And on Friday, I'm going to put in some mint. Those are all still independent variables, right? Hanging out there. DV, water bottle, measuring the change of my DV. That's all I'm doing, okay? So that is a ANOVA, three or more. Now, my factorial analysis is all those factors, right? My lemon, my lime, my pineapple, my mint, my orange, all those things. So let's say on my lime day, I decide that maybe I will heat the lime first. Or get some lime zest on there. In my lemon day, maybe I'll try a California lemon versus a uh, Florida lemon. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm manipulating those factors. That's a factorial analysis, but I'm still measuring all of those changes just on my DV, just on my water. That's it. Okay, all those different things, different factors, but I'm still wanting to know did it change the taste of my water. Now, my ANOVA is the one that has two dependent variables, okay? So I'm measuring two things now, okay? So let's say back to my, my issue with my body, right? I was sick. I'm laying in my body. I can't get sick. Not only do I have the flu, right, or some kind of flu-like symptoms while I was in the hospital, we're not really sure how, I caught an STI, right? A sexually transmitted disease while I'm laying in the hospital, ah, laying there. So a MONOVA means you've got to treat both of those things, right? My dependent variable, first my illness was just my infection, and now I ended up with an STD while in the hospital bed. That's a lawsuit for a different day, right? However, for now I'm still laying there. Oh my gosh, I've got these two things. So what I'm looking at is in three or more that are going to change both of those things. So now I have two DVs, two things that I have to get better. The book uses client self-esteem and locus of control, right? So those are my both my dependent variables. So MANOVA, ma, many, has two DVs. MANOVA is the only one that has two DVs, okay? So MANOVA, ANOVA, and the T-test. Those are the biggies. Those are the ones that you're going to see on the test. And you might see two-way ANOVA. That's not going to be the right answer. But this, and most of we're not looking to see if you know a two-way ANOVA. You're looking for a factorial analysis. You're looking for ANOVA and a MANOVA. Okay. These are parametric. What parametric means is, remember that 6895 rule? Parametric test will fit on here. That's all that means. Parametric test will fit in my 68, 95, 99. Perimeter, right? That's round. That's another word for perimeter, right? You know, the perimeter of your house, the roundness of it. Okay, so that's what that means. T-test, ANOVA, MANOVA, those things are, they are, per, they are fit on my perimeter. 
So now we get these stupid things that won't fit on my parameter. I know that my numbers are come, going to come out skewed. So then I have to use a different kind of test. And that's where those really strange names come in, right? Okay. Sorry, get my mouse in. Okay, you might see these terms. I really don't always, I don't usually teach these terms. If you've done everything else, you can go back and pick up these. I really don't usually teach these terms. Okay, I don't. That's if you use a post hoc or a multi comparison, but I don't teach them because most often you might get one or two of those. Very rarely you're not. So that's not one of the main things I teach. If you want to go back and pick it up and you know everything else, feel free to. We'll really look at this non parametric. And like I said before, non-parametrics will not fit on my bell curve. The distribution of scores is, we can assume, we cannot assume that it's normally distributed. That just means they won't fit on that bell curve, right? Normal distribution, perimeter, 68, 95, uh, 68, 99, 95, 99, they won't fit on there. So then I'm going to see these very strange names. The Mann-Whitney, the Mann-Whitney U-Test, the Wilcoxon. The Kruxel Wallace. Okay. Those are all non parametric. So, what you'll see in the question is the assumption is your answers won't line up. You won't get parametric answers, they won't fit on the curve. Okay. So, most often you just have to know one of these. I'm not, I don't usually see like knowing the difference between the three of them. What I will see though is the chi square. The chi square is a non parametric term. The chi-square is a non-parametric term that is used to measure nominal data. Remember before we talked about the um, or nominal, ordinal, those kind of things? So what I know is my chi-square is going to be used for nominal data. Okay, and again, math terms you just memorize. It's like learning and multiplication tables. You just learn them. Okay. And again, I don't ever recognize that you, that you memorize anything else. The other stuff I say that you learn, right? This one, just memorize. Sorry about that. Okay, so chi-square, nominal data. Those other strange names, Wilconsin, Crusoe Wallace, those things I don't usually teach, okay? Because I haven't seen it get that many degree that you need to know those things. Okay. My Solomon four square, have you seen that? The Solomon four square is knowing, seeing if you are looking at where that happened. Did the treatment happen in the, um, did that happen because of the actual treatment or did it happen because of something else? So your fall, fall, the Solomon four square really is looking at, was it the treatment that worked or was it something else? So if you see, there's a, it's randomized groups, of course, that makes a true experiment. And then I have a pretest, treatment, and a post-test. And every group gets something different. A great example of this, and I'm sure none of you guys, because you're all amazing, but sometimes I weigh too much, right? I go to the doctor, and the doctor tells me how much I actually weigh. That pretest, once I found out what that real number is, I can go on diet, I can do other things, but most of the time, sometimes only knowing what that number is sends me into a tizzy. <gasps> I went, what? Oh my gosh, let me, oh my gosh, let me stop eating potato chips right now. I'm sure none of you, none of you, just me. Okay, so what he's looking at, and this one is looking at, do we know, is it the actual, um, was it actually, oops, your screen, go there, screen, grab my eraser. This is what I said. Okay, so what I'm looking for is then, is it the pretreatment that caused it? So A group gets pretreatment, treatment, and post treatment. B group gets no treatment. <coughs> C group gets no, I'm sorry, C group gets no pretest. Okay. And then my last one, my Solomon Square, they get nothing but the post test. So what we're looking at is knowing where my research came from, where the change happened. So what you'll be looking for on the test is whether or not, um, whether or not these things are related. Okay. 
A null hypothesis, I see that on there, a null hypothesis is just written backwards. That's all that means. Okay, so my hypothesis is that there is a relationship between the price of gas. Uh, I, I think that gas prices have increased because of the COVID restrictions being released. That is my hypothesis. Okay, to know that, I just make it a negative. There is not a relationship between the price of gas and uh, the the COVID uh, the, the COVID um, restrictions. No, just means you take that very positive written hypothesis and change it to a null. But you don't need to know that for the test. They're not going to ask you what a null hypothesis is. So that's why I say just memorize it. Just remember it's the null hypothesis. Okay. So. And yes, back in grad school, you had to know what that means. But the null just means that you're, you're putting in a negative as opposed to a positive. Good question, though. Thanks for asking that. Okay. Uh, multiple regression. Let's look at that one, which is different than regression to the mean. The multiple regression, you are looking for relationships, the strength of the predictor. Okay. See, oh, someone's not muted. Mute yourself, somebody. Okay, so multiple regression, I'm looking for a relationship. So I'm looking at, did these things cause this? Different than, than regression to the mean, multiple regression just means, is there a predictor value? Multiple regression adds together the predictive value of several independent variables. Okay, so look at the example they give you. Predictor values such as high school GPA, classwork, and ACT scores may be used to predict the outcome of the, of the end of the year college test, right? So multiple regression, all of these variables. So I'm looking at did, um, did, uh, did was it the, the time they came to class? Was it the time they spit in class? What was it? So that is where I'm looking for measuring my dependent variable change based on multiple regression, but multiple just means many. So it's like a MANOVA, right? Many, I'm sorry, not MANOVA, an ANOVA, many different variables, but I'm looking for a prediction, which is a, a regular ANOVA does not predict. A scatter plot, okay? A scatter plot is literally where I'm plotting my X and Ys, Okay, so remember your X and Y variables. So you have you have two sets of numbers, right? Your X and your Y. You're gonna plant. You're gonna put the pair of numbers on your plot. So your X axis goes up and down. Your Y axis is the other. Your X and Y are your independent and dependent variables, right? You don't need to know how to plot it. They're not gonna ask you that. All you know is a scatter plot is I've got my X variable, right? My independent my dependent, and I'm looking for a relationship. I get numbers. So my X is three and my Y is two. And I'm gonna plot those on a, a graph. That's a scatter plot. Now, this tells me that in this one, it is homodice, it's homodicity. If you've had me before, we would talk about the importance of knowing the word homo. Homo means the same. In this scatter plot, the numbers stay together. That's homodicity. There's definitely a relationship between my X and my Y, right? My other one is heterodacity. Heterodacity means my X and my Y, those numbers may have started off together, but look at the scatter. They don't match up. Okay, homo's the same, hetero is different. So on a scatter plot, homodacity means they're the same, hetero means that they are different. Okay. That is a scatter plot. Again, your X and Y, that's all that means. Looking at the relationship. You should know that Likert scale, okay? The Likert scale is uh, the one that's always, uh, sometimes, maybe in the middle, blah, blah, blah. That's your Likert scale. One of the other things you should know is your somatic differential. Somatic differential is a little bit like the Likert scale, but it's a little different. It looks at two opposites on the other ends. So let's say I really love it or I really hate it, and I check a box in between. 
Okay, that is my. No, I'll go back. Okay, it's in your chat box. I'm gonna copy the image. Yes. Okay, so it looks at the Democratic Party. It says you think they are bad or good, and you're putting an X to closer to where you think it is. So that's a somatic differential because what you'll see is on either end, they're the opposites. One is good, one is bad. One is happy, one is sad. That's a that's a, a, a differential, a, a somatic differential scale, which is different than my Likert scale. My Likert scale is going to give me those points of. I'm putting it in your chat box, guys. So you got agree, strongly agree, strongly disagree. So strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree or disagree, agree or strongly agree. That's my Likert scale. That's a five point Likert scale. Okay, which is different than my somatic differential. And I do realize I'm like stuffing things down your throat. Uh, if, if you're testing soon, this should just be a reminder. If you're not testing soon, I will teach this again. I'm sure before your next test, I teach it at least uh, probably twice every, uh, in the 90-day period, I teach it twice. Okay. So uh, it's cross-sectional we talked about. Um, what else? Double bind. Don't need to know that one. Double bind is when neither the researcher nor the client know which one the placebo is. That helps us get rid of the bias, right? So we don't have that bias of any kind of experiment bias because I don't know which one you're getting. If any of you are parents or grandparents out here, when you were um, t um, feeding your children, introducing food to your children, one of the things that research says is if, it, if it's something that you don't like, you're supposed to smile and say yummy. You know, that little nasty little... You know, that little baby food that's like peas and carrots and yucky and mush and has no flavor whatsoever. And you're supposed to like smile when you give it to your babies. Oh my gosh, this is so good. That's to prevent bias because if you're like this frowny face on there, your kids are not going to eat it. That's all that is. That's that double bind because if I, oh, this is gross. You won't like this, will you, baby? Right? Of course you won't like it. You can see the look on your face, mama. So you're supposed to smile no matter what it is. <laughs> that prevents the bias. So she won't know that that is carrots and peas as opposed to like the um, better tasting vegetables. As an adult, I do like carrots. I don't like peas, so I can't do that. But I do like carrots. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's what that means. It's all that means is you're supposed to then uh, prevent any experiment or bias. Okay, we'll talk about the halo effect. We talk about heteron homodacity. Interrater reliability. I need interrelated reliability when I have a subjective assessment. We touched on this last week of assessments. Remember the raw shot, the black and white faces, and the, and the ink blots? I think I talked about the dancing with the stars or the Olympics, right? So things like that, there's no, when I'm looking at like the Olympics and they're doing their gymnastics routine and someone says, she, she missed the point. She hopped a second hop. She did this. That's why they're more than one raider, more than one judge, because those are not, they're, they're not objective. You know, when she's doing her floor routine, I can't go out there and measure how high her foot was, right? So it's very much subjective. It's my opinion. So when they're subjective, I need to have more than one person that's inter-rater or, or inter-observer. Same thing, right? Two people are watching. If you took the ACT back a million years ago, I know your grandkids now, right? The, the, the math, the, the, the English, all of those things are standardized scores, right? You either got it wrong or right. They put it in the machine, you spit out an answer, right or wrong. However, the writing part was inter-writer or inter-observer. Three different people read the writing part and came up with a score. Because writing can be much more subjective than objective. I can see periods, right? But if I'm looking at was your article persuasive or not, my opinion would be different than yours. So that's why I need inter-writer or inter-observer inter reliability. Okay. 
You might say things that's also this um, counseling program evaluation. The point of accountability is very new in most of our fields. So there's a couple of questions you'll see on that, like evaluation. So I said to you before, if you're doing research, it always has to be quasi, right? Because it is not okay to have someone come in thinking they're getting treatment and they're not. That is not acceptable. Okay. So when it comes to looking at how we evaluate the programs, you might see two terms. You're going to see formative and summative. Formative is as it is forming, right? Let's say you've got this new agency or you've got this new program. Oh my gosh, you guys, you're going to try DBT, right? The dialectic behavior therapy. And you're going to try it with kids, right? We've got this new program. We've got some funding money. We've tried all our therapists. We're excited. So as you're forming it, I'm going to come in and do an evaluation, right? Let's see how well it works. How well are my people trained? That is my formative while we're forming. My summative is at the end. That is my summary. Okay, at the end of the program, someone says, hey, wait, I really like the way you guys did that. You got the grant, you did the DPT, and I see that your kids are changing. Can you give me a copy of that? You're going to send them the summative. A summary. Okay. A formative in progress, summative at the end. Uh, let's see. A couple of these things you'll see on there also. Comp uh, you know, in research, you can lie. I know, believe it or not. Deception may be justifiable if there's no risk to the subjects. Duh. When you have the COVID vaccine and you run the trial, you didn't know if you were getting the placebo or the real pill, right? That's okay. That's deception. It's okay. As long as no one's at hurt. And usually at the end, there's some debriefing. I'll tell you what you really got. So that is almost always on pocket prep, right? Yes, you can lie to them. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So um, informed consent, of course, make sure that clients are aware of it. Um, the issue with informed consent, if you look back at our history, especially with um, our marginalized people, which are black, brown, or poor, there are lots of research that was done and people were not fully aware of it. So the Tuskegee is, of course, the famous one where men were giving syphilis and they were inflicted with the syphilis to see what the effect would be. They did sign the release. They did sign the form, but they didn't know what they were signing. Informed consent has to be signed, but it also has to be in a way that my client can understand it. Okay. So they have to understand what they're signing. And the, um, the um, Human Subject Committee or my IRB, that's the board you go for. So if you've done um, research, I know at the PhD level, definitely. Some of the master's level, if you did some research, it had to be approved by the IRB board. That is actually making sure that you don't do any harm to subjects. The IRB board also talks about harm to animals. So you can't use excessive harm to animals either. That's who proves our research. Okay. There's always one of those questions. You went through grad school. You know how to write APA, APA, APA. If you're submitting something for research, it has to be written in APA, right? Many of you should know APA off the back of, the back of your hand, right? Do you know we're on the APA version seven? I know. Like what? Being a professor, every time I get one down, I have to learn a new one. OK, and again, when it comes to manuscripts, I never point I never share to one manuscript. I never share more than one at a time. So I'm going to pick one. I'll share my information. If they publish it, good. If they don't publish it, then I can share it with somebody else. OK, I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to go to questions. So hold on to your questions, please, just for a few minutes. And I know we're over. If you have to go, feel free. It's recorded. Daughter's out with my car, so I'm pretending not to be stressed. Sociometry. Uh, the question in the chat box is Can you give an example of sociometry and when we use sociometric tools? Sociometry is by Jacob Moreno. He's the same guy that did our, our, our play, I'm sorry, our, um, our uh, theater, theater of spontaneity. That's where like psychodrama came from. Uh huh. And then, so uh, a sociometric, that tool is to measure the interactions between people in my group. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, thank you. You're so welcome. Okay. 
So, you know, that I teach across the board, I teach most, I teach all the professionals, actually, psychiatrists, I mean, psychologists, uh, LMFTs, LCSW. So I try to use study questions that perhaps you haven't seen before. Um, so I'm going to use a social work test today that looks at some of those research questions, okay? Okay, so can you see number one? A social work, excuse me, a correlation coefficient that is not that is not possible is what? And if you've seen this before already, don't answer. If you've never seen it, feel free to answer. You can put it in my chat box. You can say it out loud. Coalition coefficient that is not possible. I had it zero. Zero is possible. That just means there's no correlation. Okay. One that's not possible is four, right? Because perfect is 100. Okay. The best way to learn correlation coefficient is to watch daytime TV. Murray Povich says it's 99.7% that you're the father. <laughs> right? So what we're looking for is two different things, the baby's DNA and the dad's DNA. And we're looking for a relationship, a match. That's my correlation. The correlation is also known as your R value or your Pearson's momentum. Pearson's, what's it called? Pearson's momentum correlation. It's a Pearson's. You'll see a Pearson R. That's the same thing. Negative six is too low. So if I change my 9.1 to a hundred, right? Just move the decimal point. So a hundred is perfect correlation, whether it's negative or positive, right? That's perfect correlation. There can be nothing higher than perfect. However, if a hundred is the best, the lowest I will take is 0 0.70, whether it's negative or positive, it doesn't matter. That is my correlation. Okay. Let's go down and let's look at number four then. When research report their findings were significant at the 0.01 level. We talked about that. 01, so remember 95 is going to be at the 0.05 level. And 99 means it's at the 0.01 level, right? So then what is it telling me? One, there's no significance. Two, there's one chance in 10 that the result occurred by chance. Or three, there's one chance in 100 that the result occurred by chance. Or the sample was too small. What do I know? That is correct, Cindy. Yay! There's one chance in 100. Because what I know then, right, if I'm at 95 and I change my probability level, which is my P, I change it to a 0.99, then I know that if I take this, if I in, take this, uh, uh, taking it down to 0.99, then my type one errors will decrease, my type two errors will increase. Okay, number six, the closer the R value gets to one. Can I go over the first question again? Like number one and total? Amy? Unmute yourself. Talk to me. Yes, that one. Sorry. Okay. No, good. Now, Amy, you are asking the same question that other people are afraid to ask, okay? Okay, so let's work through it together. So the correlation coefficient is perfect is 100, right? So what that means is I have two items, two means, two different DNA tests, two different anything. The SAT and the ACT, those are two things. What I know is many colleges will accept either the SAT or the ACT because the assumption is if I score one, well on one, I do well on the other, right? Yes, work with me. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So, and again, stop me at any time, really, okay? So the correlation coefficient is the relationship between these two things. Correlation is relationship. Coefficient is the number. Coefficient just means a number, right? Perfect correlation is 100, okay? If I took you to the, the, the if I went to a genetic background and, and I got your, your DNA and your child's DNA, then he's going to say it's a 90.99.9% chance, right? That this is your kid, okay? We, 100 sometimes is hard to get, but we know that's, that's what we're saying, that you, you are related, okay? So if 100 is perfect, they're not going to say, I'm sorry, Cindy, did you know there's a 127% chance that this is your child? What? 100 is perfect. I can't get any better than 100. 
right? So, so the answer is 1.26. Because that's not possible. Right. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. But what's so with you? If I said to you, and I'm, I'm sure there's a Mr. Cindy. So if I said to Mr. Cindy, Mr. Cindy, do you know there's a 60% chance that that is your baby? What would you think he would say? I, he's probably not too happy about that. <laughs> D I V O R C E. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I won't accept that. That's too low. Okay. So the lowest I'll take is a 0. 0.70. It doesn't matter if it's negative or positive. Okay. Negative means that there is, again, we're the same, right? There's no way this can be your child. Or positive is yes, there is. It doesn't matter if it's negative or positive. I still want to get as close to perfect as I can. Now, for the test, we'll take 0 0.70. I don't think Mr. Cindy would take 0 0.70, just saying. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Does that make it better? Much. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Okay. Anybody else? I don't mind explaining. I really don't. I think that uh, most of us, including myself, had really sucky research teachers that didn't even speak. A, I'm, I'm going to take that back. They were great teachers. They just didn't speak a language that I understand. So I'm not a math person. You know, my dad was an engineer and so was my son. I don't know where they came from. But I'm, I'm not a math person, right? I, I'm, I'm a touchy-feely. I'm like, if, if one and one get close to two and they're happy, I'm good with that, right? They made progress, self-determination. <laughs> but that won't work on the test. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so then let's go back to this one. So what I said before, R, your Pearson's R, it's Pearson's momentum. You'll see that in the text. That is the same as correlation coefficient. So if you see R, that is the same. So the closer the R value gets to one, remember one is perfect, then the stronger the association. Exactly, exactly, right? Again, Murray Povich, okay, I'll take a 99.7. I will. It's pretty close. That's my baby, right? Okay. I'm just trying to use day to, daytime TV to make you understand because I'm sure that none of you have ever had a real paternity test in life and praying that, you know, he was not the father or he was the father, right? Because <laughs> we're all very perfect because we are. <laughs> okay. We talked about number seven. The source of illness among smoker, um, uh, the source of illness among smokers can only it can be conclusively and unequivocally proven by what? I mentioned this before. Exactly. Longitudinal studies. I'm 55. Anybody remember being a, there was a smoking pit in your high school? Oh, come on. I'm not the only old person in this room. Yes, yes. there was a smoking pit. If you were 18, you could smoke in school. <laughs> you hung out with the teachers. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, Number eight, the statistical method that is used to measure, not used to measure reliability. A statistical measure that is not used to measure reliability is what? Uh, and um, Jericho, how do you know that one? She's absolutely right. And the rest of you are trying to figure it out. All you got to do is read. Validity can't be reliability. That's it. Keywords. Yes, it. Go back to the question. You're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know, Pam. I'm sitting on the test and I can't figure this out. Oh God, what do I do? Right? You read. Okay. So reliability and validity are not the same. Validity is, is it valid? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Reliability is consistency. I remember we talked about last week that validity is the most important, right? I meet this hot guy on Tinder, Bumble, whatever you're on. I've swiped left. I've checked him out, right? Okay. So he calls me 17 times. He's consistent. Every night he calls me like he can't wait to hook up with me, right? That's reliability. He tells me he's a, 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 a prince from Dubai and I can't wait to meet him. 
And I Google his name and it comes out that he like, you know, is not, he's lying to me. He's not valid. Do I care how reliable he is? I do not. He lied to me to begin with, okay? He can pinch up my house every single day, but we still ain't going nowhere because he lied to begin with. Validity is the most important, okay? Let me stay here for a minute, though. So when we look at tests or retests, okay, that one is the Spearman G. Again, it's the Spearman prophecy, blah, 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 something, but you'll see Spearman, it's known as a Spearman G. Spearman G test that tests the, um, it tests uh, the test. So split half method means that if there's 100 questions on the test, let's say that we're doing like multiplication tables, right? And I've got, there's, there's 100. And back in my day, back in my day, we had these things called textbooks. I know, I know, like hardbound, you know, things like that. I know now everything's on like iPad. But in the back of the textbooks, the answers to the odd numbers were in the back. And she made us do the even numbers. I know, one room schoolhouse with the dinosaurs roam the land. And if you have any idea what I'm talking about, but <laughs> it didn't matter if you did the odds or the evens. It didn't matter if you did the first 50 or the second 50. If the whole test tests the same thing, split half reliability just tells me it, it wouldn't matter what you do. Okay. Parallel forms, that's also part of re reliability. So we know with the NCE, there's a form A and a form B. There's two different forms. It doesn't matter which one you get, the test is still valid. Okay. And I think I mentioned test retest. Test retest means that if I take a test the first time, okay, and I go back and I take it again, and it's a two week, two weeks. Okay, and I haven't done anything different. I'll get the exact same score. That's test, retest, reliability. Okay. If you've ever tutored with me individually, I'll say to you, between the tests, what did you do differently? Because even at two weeks, I can prove it. But I also know that if I have studied, and I've studied the exact same way, the exact same material from the first time I took it, and I take it again in 90 days, I'm going to get pretty close to the same score. That's test, retest, reliability. Okay. A cross-sectional um, study, we talked about that one. That examines the same group, two groups at one point in time, right? Two groups. I'm in front of Walmart in my city. You're in front of Walmart in your city. That's cross-sectional. Number 11, the director notifies the staff in January that there will be an ongoing study of the agency's process for receiving patients. Staff courtesy in the reception area and the frequency at which clients have to wait more than 10 minutes for their appointments. After three months, the director reports with satisfaction there were very few problems. Everyone is seen on time and the staff is extremely courteous to the clients. This must be explained by... And I don't see any of my answers being a miracle happened, right? There's no miracle that came down. So what happened? The serendipity effect, the Hawthorne effect, the stimulus response effect, or C, the effect of group pressure. Exactly, the Hawthorne effect. Okay, Amy, explain to me what that means. Uh, How do I know that in the question? Because they know that they're being basically, they're, there's an ongoing study, everybody up their game. Bingo, bingo, exactly. Someone is watching. You get my bell. Yes, good. Fourteen. In a study measuring whether people are willing or are willing to spend more or less time commuting to work, the level of measure would be. It's a study. We're looking at whether people spend more time or less time. Ordinal, interval, nominal, or ratio. Lisa, you said it was an interval. Prove it to me. How do I know? What words in the question? Because of time. Yeah, yes. Time. Interval is time. Good, good, good. I need the bell, Dr. P. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lisa. Okay, so when I ring the bell to indicate you gave me a great answer, what law does that affect? Which law tells me that? 
It is positive reinforcement. It is. I'm adding on something. However, it's also Thorndike's law. What is that one, guys? It is the law, law of effect. effect. Which means? That a behavior has to be rewarded immediately after. Yes! Oh, yes! That's it! Perfect! Exactly. So I did do positive reinforcement, which is Skinner, right? So Skinner says, I'm going to add something on because I like your behavior and I want it to keep happening. And then the law of effect says, if I want behavior to change, consequences or reinforcement needs to happen as close to the behavior as possible. Yay! My babies are learning. Okay, <laughs> 15. The highest degree of correlation is shown by which? Negative 70, 0 0.30 or 0 0.80. That is correct. Okay. If it was negative 0 0.80, would that still be the right answer? It would be. If it was negative 0.0, it doesn't matter. Correlation is relationship. So as the price of gas goes down, right, and unemployment goes down, that's still a negative, right? But it's a relationship. So it doesn't matter if they go up or down. I'm just looking for the relationship. Good. Okay, so the most frequent case is the mode, median, mean, or standard deviation. What does that mean? The most frequent case. My median is the exact middle, right? The number is the exact middle. My mean, I'm sorry, my mean is the average. He's the guy in charge. And my mode is the one that appears the most often. Perfect. We also remember last week we talked about assessments. We looked at what happens if I have a skewed distribution. Okay. In a skewed distribution, in a regular bell curve, the 68, 95, 99, right? Those numbers are all the same. Mean, median, and mode are the same. But when they're not the same, we're going to remember that the mean guy is in charge, right? The mode is going to set the curve. He's the highest point. Okay, go away, ads. Okay. My mode is the, my mean is the mean guy. He tells me which way we're going to go, right? The mode, though, is the highest curve. Ice cream a la mode because the mode is what most people got. So if I'm a classroom teacher, I gave a test, right? And on my test, the mode was going to be, let's say the mode, five kids got 60 on it. But the average, the mean, the rest of the class scored an 80. Is that a positive or a negative skew? Mean guy's in charge. Mean guy pulls the curve. Yeah, yes! You're signing it as a guess. I'm not sure who said positive. Okay, but it's a positive because the mean... Oh, Twyla, thank you. The mean guy is in charge. The mode is the class average. So five kids got a 60, right? They set the top of the curve. But the mean guy, he scored an 80. So the mean guy's pulling it up. Hey, 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 right? Because 80 is bigger than 60. Right? Same thing on the other side. So let's say the mean is 60, right? Five kids in the test scored a 60. And then the average of the class was a 30. Right? Either of these five kids cheated or they're really smart, right? But if the mean guy's a 30 and he's lower than the mode, he's pulling it down because the mean guy is in charge. Yes, exactly. Okay. That's a negative skew. Okay. So that's what my, that's why I need to know my mean, mean, and mode. My mean, mean, and mode. Did I upset you? I know math is hard, but you don't have to cry. Oh, that was funny, by the way. My kids will say, uh, Mom, if you have to tell people it's funny, it's probably not funny. 
Okay, so what was I? I lost. Sorry. <laughs> You're good. Okay. Here we go. 17. A researcher testing the outcome of a new medication gives one group the drug and the other group the placebo. The placebo is what? Is it, and I'm going to make it easier for you. It's either A or B, one or two. Okay. Is it the dependent variable or the independent variable? I'm always going to remember my dependent variable is where I measure my outcome. Okay. So I'm testing the outcome of new medication. So then my placebo is. It is a dependent variable. Yes, it is. You got it. So what is my, oh, sorry. Oh, wait, wait, oh, wait, wait, wait. My placebo is not my independent variable. That is not right. Let me go back. That is so not right. Okay. <coughs> my dependent variable is where I'm measuring the change. Okay. So I'm looking at the outcome of the new medication. That is my dependent variable is the outcome. Okay, so the placebo is the independent variable. The placebo is two. Both the placebo and the drug are the independent variables. And I will know if they worked, whether or not my client got better. So the outcome, what I'm measuring in the outcome is the dependent variable. Right? Questions? Are we lost? Okay, let's try again then. Okay, so we're looking at 20 and 21. A researcher hypothesized that the greater the racial homogeneity among the members of group, the greater the level of cohesion. Okay, this is a research question, right? So, okay, I'm thinking I want to measure Homogeneity, remember, we talked about homo, the same, the same, okay? So if my groups are the same race, then I'm thinking that the cohesive, that they'll be more cohesive, right? That's the research. When I see a question, I'm always looking at what am I going to measure? How will I know if this worked? Because that's where I know my dependent variable. I'm measuring the results of my dependent variable, right? So if this is true, then my dependent variable will be the cohesiveness of the group, right? That's my dependent. So race is then going to be my, okay, Sharice, you said three. We even talked about sampling variables. Stay in my question. My race is my, my independent. Race is independent, right? Because I said homogeneity, if they're the same race or if they're not the same race, that's what I'm measuring, right? If they're not the same race, that's, that's what I'm measuring. So race is my independent variable. And then my dependent variable is going to be the closeness. So then 21, the degree to which the dependent variable will be found, my dependent variable, I'm measuring the closeness. So what would that my answer be then? One, reflection of how the members use the collective we. Two, suggest how often su suggested by the race of the leader. Three, reflected by the intelligence of the members. Or four, seen in how many people want to join the group. One, one, one. One, 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 one is correct. That's exactly it. So that is how I'm going to measure that, right? Of how close they are. My phone had rang in like like 10 minutes. I'm like, why? It was dead. <laughs> My phone rings like every minute on the minute. So okay, so 24. One social worker with a caseload of twice as many of clients as a colleague reflects the measurement on what? Interval, ordinal, racial, or nominal? Ratio. Ratio is what? Come on, twice as many. Is that a ratio? No. Yeah. 
So you should be between ordinal or ratio. That's what you should be stuck between. So is it a ratio or is it or is it an ordinal? Tell me why. Or across the board here. Racial or no? Because it could be zero or it could be twice as much. Ratio is has a true zero. I have no idea. I'm just guessing. And your guess would be right. Right? Okay. So my ratio is going to be twice as much. If it said that an ordinal, oh my gosh, I'm in third place. That's order, right? But ratio, got, oh, okay. So, and ratio is quantitative. Look at that, that was some stuff. Good, 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 good. Okay. So as if you know this one, the level of measurement that provides the least valid information, the least valid would be which one? That would be correct. That is nominal because it's groups, categories. That prevents, that gives me the least amount of information. 28, validity refers to what? The correspondence between the concept being measurement and the measurement tool. The extent to which different observers could get the same findings. Three, the method of sampling. Four, the existence of sufficient data to offer proof of the hypothesis. Validity. What does validity refer to? Got it. Is, am I measuring what I'm supposed to measure? Okay, validity. Remember, I've talked about those dollar store pregnancy tests. And if you work at Dollar Tree, please do not put me on Facebook and blast me out because they're, they're great. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying I'd be concerned with buying a dollar for my unborn child, right? So the measurement tool, a pregnancy test, and what's being measured. So I want it to be valid. If it is you know, out of date, it's sat in the car, it's been in the warehouse, all those things, it may not be valid. I'm a dollar store fan. Well, I actually don't shop now anymore. I just do like have things delivered because of COVID. But if I, when I did shop, I'm a Dollar Tree fan. So please don't put me on Facebook and how I don't like the Dollar Tree. Okay, 30. In experiment, the control group, the control group, right? One is the same as experimental group, except for the introduction of a causal variable. Two, never tested before or after the introduction of the experimental variable. Three, always given a placebo, or four, chosen at random. The control group. So, okay. The word always is scary. Remember those all or none? Okay, they're not always given a placebo. Sometimes the control group gets nothing. Oh, causal variable, causal. Okay, so causal means that it's going to be quantitative. Anything that's cause and effect is quantitative. So it doesn't always have to be causal. So that can't be either. Okay. Okay, well, I see that. Um, so um, the one that's not being manipulated. But that doesn't give me an answer. So which is the best answer of these? Four. Exactly. Chosen at random. Perfect. Next week, I'll teach you on how to answer the questions, right? Okay. But what I'm looking for is in a control group. Always scares me. Because I talked to you a few minutes ago about a nocebo where you get nothing, right? Those alls are, those all and nuns are just never true. But they are chosen at random. Okay. So the control group is the one that gets nothing, but they may not have a placebo. They may just give a nocebo, which is nothing. In a normal distribution, the percent of all cases within two standard deviations of the mean. This is a rule. It's a rule. It's a rule. 68, 95, 99. Sometimes you might see 96 because it's 95 and change. You might see 96, but it's a rule. 68, 95, 99.
The first standard deviation is always going to be 68, right? The second one is always going to be that. Always, always, always. Those are rules in math. I know that all of you are probably like me, and you chose your major you, when you started grad school. You went and you looked at how many math classes you have to take. And you said, wait, this one takes no math classes or just one. Let me be a counselor. Okay, that was just me, right? <laughs> 37. The measure of central tendency that provides the least amount of information. The least. Okay, we're going to rule out A because A is not one of those even terms, right? My mode, my mean, and my median. Okay, so the one that provides the least amount of information is that is my median. You're absolutely right. That's why I tell you when you see those questions like mean, median, mode, and the mean is pulling it to the left. I don't care about the median. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care about that guy at all. 39, the type of sampling that allows a population of equal chance of being included in the sample is random, quota, accidental, or purposeful. If everyone gets an equal chance, of course, it is random. It is random. Quota means that I have to meet a quota. I need a certain amount of people. So if I'm going to do an ad hoc at the end, remember, go back and add on people. I might use quota because I need so many people, so many black people, so many white people, so many pregnant people. OK. Ooh, look at 40. The dependent variable is the causal variable, the spurious variable, the effect variable or a correlation against type three. So we know that four is not the answer, right? Not the answer. Okay. The effect variable, what does that mean? The dependent variable is where I'm going to measure the change, right? The effect, the effect. Did the placebo work? Did the medicine work, right? That is the F, that is that. Causal is cause and effect. Cause and effect always belongs to quantitative. Remember that, guys. Those are key words that you'll see. Cause and effect. Okay. Uh, 43. A researcher wants to test the effect of a group therapy program on the recidivism of prisoners and randomly selects two groups of prisoners. It's random. And I like that. To test the impact of therapy in the controlled experiment, what? One, neither group should receive therapy while in prison. Two, one group should receive treatment while the other does not. After release, both groups' rates of recidiv recidivism should be compared. Or three, only one group should receive group therapy. The other group should receive individual treatment. Or four, both groups should receive group therapy. I'm looking at the randomly chosen, and I'm looking, I'm trying to test the impact of the control experiment. Got it. One group receives treatment, right? Is that the control group or is that the experimental group? Who gets the treatment? The experimental group. Got it. My control group gets nothing. Are they going to no nocebo or placebo, right? That's how I know if my experiment works. Because I've got one group who gets nothing and one group who gets something. Okay. Okay, guys. I've given you lots and lots of time. Let me do one more. Number uh, 47. Select the range of possible values of a correlation coefficient. Got it, because the best I can get is 100, right? That's the best I can get. Let's look at 48. If a researcher plans to study the norms of the age at a residential hotel, the most effective is the most effective method is to what? 
You're trying to study the norms of the aged at a residential, a residential hotel. They live there. The norms are what they normally do. What would, would be the most effective means? Contact a social worker. Ask a police officer. Ask active residents about the norms or administer a questionnaire to everyone at the hotel. Okay, so four is out, right? Because I don't really care about everyone at the hotel, do I? I only care about the aged and I want to know their norms, which is their normal routine. So all I'm going to do is ask them about their norms. Three is my answer. Okay. Ooh. The perimeter. Remember I talked about non-parametric and parametric? That's what that means, the perimeter. One, it is an unobtrusive measure. Two, the characteristics of a sample. Three, the characteristics of a population. Or four, the combination of scores in an interval. What is my perimeter, my parameter? Got it. Remember my 68, 95, 99? That's a parametric. Everything is lined up. So the characters of the population of the 100 people, we know 68 or two-thirds of them would fit into there. An unobtrusive measure would be, for example, looking at a, uh, doing a case study, a histogram, history, anything where I'm not in the client's face. Okay? If I can observe through a two-way mirror, that's unobtrusive. If I'm in the classroom, I have to worry about what? What effect if I'm in the classroom? Yes, the Hawthorne effect because they know they're being watched. Yes, got it. So if I'm going to be unobtrusive, they don't need to know they're being watched because the Hawthorne effect says that they will change their behavior. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. One important difference between quantitative and qualitative analysis studies are, remember, quantity and quality. One, qual quantitative analysis get more exact accurate results. Two, quantitative studies use numbers as their unit of analysis and qualitative studies use words. Three, qualitative studies use more easily, are more easily generalized to the population. Or four, both require use of random. That is correct. That is two. Quantitative are numbers, right? That's my ratio or my interval. And quality are going to use numbers. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Oh, I talked about this a minute ago. The null hypothesis. Oh, remember? Okay. Must be disproved at a 0.5% probability level for the hypothesis to be effective. Must be disproved at the 0.01 probability level for the hypothesis to be accepted. Must be disproved at the 0 0.08 or must be disproved at the 0 0.10. What's my answer? My answer is 1. Right? My null should be proved at the 95%. 95 out of 100, right? That's all it takes is the 0 0.05. However, if I drop that to 0 0.99, where there's a 1% chance out of 100, then what I do know is my, my type 1 errors will decrease. They will go down. Okay? 59, type 1 and type 2 errors refer to one, mistakes in applying for a federal government research grant. <laughs> okay. Mistakes in using random number tables. Three, mistakes in rejecting or accepting the null. Or four, mistakes in entering data in the computer. Of course it is. Of course it is. You guys got it. Okay. Okay, guys. I'm going to wrap you up. Hey, Pam. One second. 